Good evening, and uh, thank you for attending our annual awards ceremony for the National Collegiate Book Collecting Contest. I'm uh, John Van Aldenoren, the director of the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress, uh, and I'm here to welcome you. Uh, a word about the Center for the Book. Uh, the Center for the Book was established in 1977 with the mission to promote books, reading, libraries, and literacy nationwide. We do that through a network of affiliates in every state, the District of Columbia and the U.S. Virgin Islands, and we're also working on an affiliate in Puerto Rico. Hopefully we'll hear about that soon. Uh, the center also plays a major role in the library's National Book Festival and administers the Library of Congress Literacy Awards. The Poetry and Literature Center, um, home of the U.S. Poet Laureate, is also a part of the Center for the Book. The National Collegiate Book Collecting Contest was established in 2005 by Fine Books and Collections Magazine to recognize outstanding book collecting efforts by college and university students. The program aims to encourage young collectors to become accomplished bibliophiles. And of course, you're going to hear more about uh, the latest uh, generation of these, uh, group of these bibliophiles and their accomplishments. But before, before we do that, I want to acknowledge and thank our institutional partners, the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America, the Fellowship of American Bibliophilic Societies, the Grolier Club, uh, and the Rare Book and Special Collections Division of the Library of Congress. Uh, I'd also like to say a word of thanks to Guy Molinara from the Center for the Book. Uh, he's the uh, doer who makes all these uh, events happen in the, uh, in the Center for the Book. And last but not least, I'd like to spe make special mention of the J.I. Kislak Foundation. Uh, the foundation has generously supported many activities and exhibitions at the Library of Congress, including this program. Unfortunately, as many of you may know, Jay Kislak uh, passed away earlier this month. Um, one need only visit the Great Hall in this building to see the magnificent Kislak collection on permanent display to witness the extent of Mr. Kislak's generosity and also the degree to which he himself was a great collector. Um, so please uh, join me in thanking the Kislak Foundation and all our partners. And we, we have back here Arthur Dunkelman from the Kislak Foundation, and uh, I just wanted to acknowledge Arthur. Um, on behalf of the Library of Congress, I congratulate the winners and their accomplishments as bibliophiles. Um, speaking of bibli bibliophiles, we will soon hear from renowned book collector Glenn S. Miranker, uh, and thank you, Glenn, for joining us. Uh, I'm now supposed to turn the program over to John Cole. If, if you see in your program, John Cole was the um, was the director of the Center for the Book for 39 years. I'm not going to be in this job for 39 years. I just started in March, and I don't think I don't think I'll make 39 years. But John was the moving force behind the Center for the Book for all that time. Unfortunately, he has been called away uh, and wasn't able to make it this evening. So we'll skip John and go right to uh, Mark Dimunation, the uh, uh, the uh, chief of the Rare Book and Special Collections. Division, who will introduce our speaker. Mark? Spoiler alert, I'm not Mark. <laughs> oh, the mic? Oh, okay. The other mic. Okay, does this work? Okay. So, spoiler alert, I am not Mark. I'm Susan. And I work for the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America. Um, Every year, we try to find a speaker who has a, a collection that uh, has a connection to their collection that will speak to the winners of this, con this contest. And this year, we have Glenn Maranker. Uh, Glenn has had a storied career in the tech sector, in addition to being a bibliophile. Uh, Glenn has a bachelor in commu computer science from Yale as well as a master's and doctorate from MIT. He grew up in New York, uh, but after completing his studies, he moved to California and held several positions in Silicon Valley startups. He was recruited by Steve Jobs to join Next Computer in 1990 and Apple in 1996. He was active in hardware development and retired as, excuse me, and was Apple's chief technology officer prior to retiring. 
Glenn is a longtime bibliophile. He has a collecting focus on Sherlock Holmes. He is also an expert on cryptology and is the director of the National Cryptological Foundation. Thank you so much, Glenn, for being here. Just Glenn. Not very impressive for a high-tech guy, huh? <laughs> Can't even move a microphone. So um, I just want to let you folks know, uh, per a personal note, that uh, when I did retire, I retired with the idea, I had, a ver I had a vague notion, God knows I won't call it a plan, uh, that I would spend the balance of my life indulging the two things that I really enjoyed other than building computers. And uh, that was uh, collecting, studying, being around books, particularly Sherlockiana, and uh, the history of cryptography. And I gave it a try for about a year, and I found it completely absorbing and satisfying and worthwhile. So I haven't gone back to work. Absolutely. And I don't have any intent of going back to work. But what I would like to say is that you know when collectors talk about the thrill of the chase, we usually mean the pleasures of pursuit, the satisfactions of ownership. We mean things like scrutinizing auction listings, poring over catalog after catalog, visiting bookstores, antiquarian bookshops, all in the hope of tracking down a particular volume and uh, finding a surprise gem and adding it to our library. There are lots of reasons to collect books and as many kinds of collections as, uh, 10 times as many kinds of collections as there are people in this room. Uh, uh, among my, more, uh, my favorite examples is I know a collector collects books on kissing. And one member at the Book Club of California has a wonderful collection on medical quackery. I even know a collector who has assembled the definitive collection of Duncan Hines recipes. <laughs> Collectors, as opposed to accumulators, assemble collections of books and ephemera that they love subjects that transfix them, topical areas that they want to know more about. I collect Sherlock Holmes. I love the stories, the atmospherics, being transported back to 19th century London, Conan Doyle's brisk storytelling and those dazzling deductions, but that's not why I collect. The reason I collect is I have no choice. I have a disease. I suffer from the malady Nick Baez Baines captures perfectly in his book, A Gentle Madness. But questing and acquiring are only part of my bibliomania. Many books have a tale to tell beyond, what, beyond what's printed between their covers. And tracking down the backstory for a book is another thrill of the chase for me. And it's a good deal less costly than acquiring books. My becoming one of the gently mad happened in 1976 when my wife, Kathy, gave me a gift. My collection at that point was absolutely non-existent. I had shown a uh, uh, unhealthy, unnatural in interest in Sherlock Holmes. I belonged to a couple of societies where we met and ate and drank and discussed the canon and other things. But my entire Sherlock Holmes library consisted of the two volume complete sh stories, Doubleday, 1950, whatever, Doubleday edition. That was it. And as Kathy handed me this copy of the American Casebook, I stared at it and I remarked, you mean you don't have to be J.P. Morgan to collect books? This was a new idea for me. Well, since that moment, I found more attractive copies than that 1976 gift. Yet it remains one of my favorite books. It's not the words on the page that interest me as a collector. I'm after things that you can't see at first glance. I seek out books that are more than books, books that are fascinating and remarkable because of a backstory. Many books have a tale to tell beyond that what's between their covers. Tracking down the backstory for my books is a principal thrill of the chase for me, and it's a good deal less costly than acquiring. Each book, in a different way, is a portal into times past, an interest for conjuring up a glimpse of the thoughts, 
the sensibilities, the machinations, even the crimes of previous owners or readers. A book can be a veritable time capsule of the year and the place it was written, published, and distributed. The discovery of the backstories for these and other books in my library is a work in progress, certainly a quest without end, just the way I like it. Let me show you just a couple of examples. I think my compulsion will start to make sense to you. Let's consider the second Sherlock Holmes story, The Sign of Four. If we overlook the printing errors, the text in the $7 Penguin or the free ebook edition is no different than the text in the story's first appearance in Lippincott's magazine. But the backstories are what make the editions of The Sign of Four particularly fascinating. First, there's a story about how it even came to be written. Are any of you familiar with it by any chance? Besides Mike? <laughs> Lippincott's magazine had de decided in 1890 that they, wanted to ex that they needed to expand their business and so decided they were going to off going to start offering an, a, a Br an English version of, a British version of their publication. And they were also looking for new fresh authors. And so they decided to send a, an agent, uh, Mr. J.M. Stoddard, to Great Britain to uh, seek out some new young authors and commission some new work. And so Mr. Stoddard took two young authors out to dinner. Uh, this, was, this was the uh, summer of 1890. Uh, one of those authors was Arthur Conan Doyle. They struck a deal, and some six, seven weeks later, Arthur Conan Doyle delivered the manuscript for the sign of Doring de Grey. The second author also struck a deal with Mr. Stoddard at that dinner, a fellow named Oscar Wilde. And a year later, he delivered the manuscript for the picture of Dorian Gray. Conan Doyle's story was only a modest success in the UK. It sold fewer than 1,000 copies in its first year. But it was wildly popular in the United States thanks to its illegal publication by a myriad of American pirate publishers. These sales were very brisk. And although they brought ACD no income in the US, they did cement his popularity. This is a fascinating area in US publication history, endlessly fascinating to me. It was rapacious, brazen, unregulated, Phenomenal profits for some pirateers and bankruptcies for most of them, though. The backstory of pirate publishing is well represented in my collection. I have more than 1,200 distinct pirated editions from more than 45 different American publishers of the, work, of the Sherlockian works of Arthur Conan Doyle. The first authorized American edition of the sign did not appear until two years after its magazine publication in Lippincott's. But in the meantime, the pirates were churning out books, paperback, hard-covered books. In fact, the champion of them all was an expat, a, a Canadian by birth, named John Lovell. Uh, he was by far the biggest in terms of, of, of number of volumes actually shoved out into the public. Now, this was certainly not his motivation, but these pirateers actually did a great public service. They made literature widely affordable. Uh, before, the, bef uh, before the pirateers, a book could cost five, six, seven dollars, which at the time would be uh, uh, equivalent to 100 glasses of beer. So it was a lot of money. And they were churning out these books at a quarter, a dime, if you subscribe to a whole bunch of them, even as inexpensive as a nickel. And in 1895, I believe it was, John Lovell <coughs> published nearly half of the hardbound books in the United States of America. His nickname, by the way, was Book of Day Lovell by, by his competitors. <laughs> There's a particular book I'd like to share with you. This copy of The Sign of Four was pirated by the United States Book Company. This was one of Book of Day Lovell's imprints. You can see that it's warmly inscribed by Conan Doyle. Yet I promise you, Conan Doyle, with authors like Mark Twain, Rudyard Kipling, and other contemporaries, despised the American pirateers. So why did Conan Doyle sign the pirate? Where? When? Whose book was it? This signature is surprising and inappropriate as finding a pickled calf's foot in a cornflakes. 
This is, this is the second back story around the sign I would like to talk about. I've only been able to locate about six pirated books that Conan Doyle inscribed. Curiously, they were all signed when Conan Doyle was in Chicago. He made a grand tour of America in late 1894. They're all United States Book Company publications. This particular, uh, edition, this particular book is inscribed to one Mr. Harlow N. Higginbotham. Now, who the heck is Harlow N. Higginbotham? Well, it turns out he was a very important figure in Chicago. He was a leading businessman, civic leader, philanthropist. He was a senior partner in the Marshall Field Department Store. He was the founder of the Field Museum. And he was president of the World's Columbian Exposition, the World's Fair that was held in Chicago in 1893. This fair, by the way, brought us words like midway and also brought us an attraction which we now call the Ferris wheel. So how did the Higginbothams and Conan Doyle meet? Well, here's the story I pieced together with help from Frederick Kittle's monograph, Arthur Conan Doyle Visits Chicago, and from contemporary Chicago newspapers that I found in the Newberry Library where Fred's collection now resides. And I have to credit the enthusiastic help of librarians and curators, Autumn Mather, Katie McMahon, and Jenny Schwartzberg, without which I'm not sure I would have managed to do the research on this book. Conan Doyle first toured America in 1894, and he, and he stopped in Chicago three times between October 2nd and December 8th. His name, by the way, was incorrectly uh, uh, reported in Chicago newspapers as Arthur Cannon Doyle, as a consequence of which people started referring to him with the honorific reverend for the balance of his trip. His first official undertaking in the Windy City was a talk in Oct on October 12th for Chicago, at Chicago 20th Century Club entitled Facts and Fiction About Great English Novelists. The club met in a little bijou theater on the third floor of Higginbotham's Michigan, Michigan Avenue mansion. It was there that the author inscribed three books for Higginbotham, Study in Scarlet, The Sign of Four, and Micah Clark, all pirated editions. New York bookseller James Cummins, who was the source of my inscribed copy, sold the, th sold the three in 1991. Cummins got the book from an elderly Chicago collector who had relocated to New York some years before and who asked that his identity be kept confidential. So there the trail of provenance ends. The two gentlemen were again together at dinner in Conan Doyle's honor after Conan Doyle's lecture. I surmise that Higginbotham purchased the books especially for the occasion. Why? When we take a close look at the ownership signature, we find it's dated October 12, 1894, the very day of Conan Doyle's lecture. So conjecture, Higginbotham ran out, quick got a couple of Conan Doyle books, and brought them back home to get them signature, signed. Now we're left with the problem, though. How do we know that the ownership signature is correct? Well, Higginbotham was the president of the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, and as the president, he had his signature on every admission ticket, and a search on eBay readily turned one up. So I had the admission ticket to compare to the book. As we discussed earlier, the novel of study, which sold for a mere 50 pounds, and the sign, which was only a mod the sign of four, which was only a modest success in the UK, the stories that changed Conan Doyle's fortunes were the Sherlock Holmes short stories. The first dozen appeared in the Strand Magazine 1891 through 1892, and they were collected into a book in late 1892, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Let's have a look at a particularly interesting copy of The Adventures. The first edition of The Adventures sold some 10,000 copies in its first year. And the success also ignited the, the uh, sales of Conan Doyle's earlier titles. For example, within one week of the appearance of The Adventures, 3,000 copies of The Sign of Four were sold in the UK. That's three times as many copies as the entire run of the first edition in two, just two years earlier. If we open this, take a look, if we open this book, we see that this copy has been inscribed by the author. 
with Arthur Conan Doyle's kindest regards. What's particularly fascinating is the date of the inscription. October 6th is, the eight, is eight days before the book's official publication date. So likely, this volume is what you and I would call an author's sample copy. As an author's sample copy presented to some relative or friend, I have, I have other copies of the adventures with uh, interesting backstories, but there's one that I give the prize for being the most dramatic because of its bibliographic importance and because of the human drama that surrounds the man who owned it just before me. And this is the third, this is the third backstory I'd like to explore. I'm rushing because I have not been given the usual three hours for my presentation. <laughs> What you see here is the only known copy of the true first edition, first state of the adventures in a dust jacket. Since Sherlock Holmes first inspired the birth of Sherlockians, as, as we students of, the, of Sherlock and Watson and the canon call ourselves, it's been unclear whether this edition was issued with a dust jacket. Sherlockians, collectors, booksellers have researched and debated the question for decades and decades. But when this book finally came to light in the spring of 1984, the dust jacket's existence was indisputable. This bibliographic discovery emerged as part of another story, the story of a man named Mark Hoffman. He was the owner before me. I hear from the chuckles that some of you are familiar with Mark Hoffman. Mark Hoffman, uh, again, shortage of time, was the Mormon forger. Uh, he was, he was, sorry, yes, the FBI called him the best forger who's ever been caught. Uh, he forged all kinds of materials, um, and I won't go through the list, it's staggering. Uh, you know, Daniel Boone letters, Emily Dickinson poems, et cetera, which all asked extremely detailed expert examinations. But his most steady customer, his most uh, easy mark, was the Mormon church. He would miraculously produce uh, letters, documents, uh, Bibles with, with handwritten family records on the, on the end paper, the uh, front free end paper, uh, with great regularity. And of course, the Mormon church is very eager to gather up any materials related to their history. But he was even cleverer than that. He would always put one little fact in it that was embarrassing to the church orthodoxy. <laughs> so he was absolutely certain that the church would buy it and send it into the basement where nobody could see it. Well, things, start, things caught up with him. He had accepted a very large uh, uh, advance from the Mormon church in order to find this rumored very large cache of early Mormon um, uh, letters. As the months went by and he did not come up with the goods, finally the church ran out of uh, patience and asked for their money back. Now nobody knows for sure, but uh, the speculation is that in order to take the eyes off of himself, Mark Hoffman decided what he should do is he should blow up a few people. And he built a couple of bombs, and two people were actually killed. Uh, and he had a third bomb. We don't know for sure who it was intended, but he evidently had an accident, and he blew himself up. Not fatally, grievously injured. At any rate, to jump to the punchline, this is his new home. I, it's, it's the, um, he was rec recently moved to uh, this uh, Draper, Utah penitentiary, slightly, slightly less uh, austere than his original home, which was the Orem State Pen. Given that he defrauded the Mormon church, that he murdered a couple of devout Mormons, um, and he's in Utah State Pen, I don't think he's going to get out for, on parole. And to make reparations, Hoffman, who had his own book collection, it was sold off, and the proceeds were used to reimburse the Mormon church. I was fortunate enough to acquire what's known as the blue book. But, you know, 
my time is up. So as you, as you might suspect, I am happy to talk further about any of these stories and of course answer any other questions you might have about my collection collecting or any of the other bizarre books that are in it. Thank you. Six minutes under my allocation. How about six seconds under my allocation? Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Tell us about the blue book. What's that? Oh, that's the blue book. The, oh, the, 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 the yes, because okay. of the because of the jacket. Is the jacket a forgery? Yeah. Great question. We've looked we've looked very very carefully, and um, uh, as as best we can tell, no. But uh, and it seems it seems unlikely he would have a forgery in his own collection. But it's possible. The book, the book actually has been, uh, I ha have traced its provenance. It actually, uh, well, it's somewhat back in time. It, a it, it actually, which, which is not to say this isn't a copy of the real thing. But uh, the book first turned up in a bookstore in uh, Chicago. Um, the, the book deal is long gone, maybe familiar, maybe familiar by name to some of you, Larry Konetka. And, uh, but he never spilled the beans about where he got it. And, I've even been in touch uh, with a couple of folks who worked in Connecticut's bookstore at the time, in the, in the uh, early 70s, and neither, neither of them has any recollection of the book. Did you put a dust jacket to protect you on that book? No. <laughs> no, I'm not. I, 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 I am do. I, I'm sorry? How do you feel about it? Oh, oh, I have dust jacket protectors on almost all my books, but that, that dust jacket is so tender. It, Nice clamshell. No, no, no. It's in a clamshell and, and and all by itself. I I don't have the courage to to put it into a, a dust jacket protector. Well, thank you. Close your computer. Oh, yeah, just shut it. Just Thanks very much. Hi, everyone. I'm Mark Demunation. I'm chief of Rare Books. Uh, for those of you who weren't um, in the division, we just had a bit of a frolic over in the Rare Book and Special Collections division where we were looking at um, collections that had been given to the Library of Congress by previous collectors. I like to frame it that way because there's always a. <laughs> what is it picking up? My phone? It's picking up it's yeah. my personality. Um, so we're going to um, flip the order of the awards, um, mostly because um, um, Samuel said that he really liked a lot of drama and really wanted to wait to the very end. Where are you? So, there you are. So to uh, appease the, the first prize winner, we're going to have him come up last which means we're going to uh, start off with um, our essayist. Anna, if you'd like to come up. It's picking up something. You're going to, I'm going to talk about you. You can, you don't be so, I'm not going to hurt you. Very good. Yeah, that's, you wrote it though, so it'll be helpful. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the nature of the competition this year, which was really interesting. We seem to have struck a moment in a generation of collectors in which book collections have become very personal to their experience. Every single one of the uh, award winners today collect collections that in some very direct way speak either to their ancestry or their identity, their current identity. Whether it be um, relatives from uh, Sicily, whether it be uh, growing up as a hyphenated American, um, or something in between. Each of these collections has a very personal connection. And as a result, uh, when Anna's um, essay uh, came up, we felt that it, it really reflected directly the experience of many of the collectors. And as a result, we don't always give essay prizes, but congratulations on that. I want to give you just a taste of it, and then I'm going to ask her really extremely difficult questions. Um, her essay goes into a bit of a discussion of what it's like uh, 
to live in a culture in which you don't initially have a fluency and how you go about obtaining that fluency, whether it be uh, through language or ultimately through literature. And there's a paragraph that I was really struck by in this essay, and I'm just going to read it, and then the rest is your show. Um, and I hope I do justice to it. Um, I discover hospitality in migrant, exile, and war literatures, especially in the tragic comic each, in each. The convergence of these literary traditions and the many languages in which they materialize reflect not only my own experience of a divided self, but also my life within a pluralized conception of home. In my collection are books that showcase how contemporary U.S. literatures travel beyond two nation states and among many nodes of a network, the multiple migrations within a single text. Um, it's a, a, a lovely essay that introduces a collection that's very personal, so come on up to the mic. So I would like you just to, um, if you would, um, uh, give us a, a little bit of a description of what your collection entails and what your essay covers so they can share that uh, experience. Okay, so it started out as a collection about colonialism of Africa and the Caribbean, and then now I'm, because of my dissertation project, I'm trying to reevaluate what colonialism means globally. So I'm looking at different forms of colonialism on a global scale, being sensitive to historicizing them in depth. So now I'm looking at the Balkans through a post-colonial lens by involving the Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and these empires that don't usually get talked about when we talk about post-colonialism. So that's the new obsession. Yes, and the essay will give Kafka. you, and Kafka. There's always Kafka. The uh, essay will give you a taste of the fact that this comes from, among other things, a very personal um, experience of, of growing up in a situation in which languages and identity uh, have fluidity and meaning at the same time uh, and is a really uh, profound, uh, I think, coverage of the collecting impulse that we've seen throughout the program today. So could you please have a round of applause for her? Don't leave. Thank you very much. Third place, Hannah. Far from the eyes, far from the heart, my life as a Syrian-American Muslim. Um, as I mentioned, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, each of the collections that uh, won awards uh, were tied directly to the experience of an individual collector and seeking out a certain kind of identity. In many cases, trying to reconcile that identity uh, with um, a citizenship in America as well. Um, and as a hyphenated American myself, I had um, a great deal of sympathy, which um, much of the time was being expressed. Um, Hannah's essay um, introduces a collection that's very personal in terms of her uh, ongoing experience with uh, the literature um, of her childhood. And it tells the story of uh, growing up in Portland but being taken back to Syria, I guess, is a way of saying it, first under objection and then ultimately um, under an effort to make sure that she was both fluent and literate. Um, and so the collection includes stages of her life and books that have meaning in each of those. So uh, uh, fairy tales that were translated by her mother into uh, Arabic so that she would have Arabic texts to read as a child, then going on to the books that were collected while in Syria, then coming back and, and reading more classical poetry um, uh, in Arabic and on to, uh, I would almost say, a kind of comic sense of identity that appears uh, throughout. I just wanted to share um, one aspect of this, which I related to entirely. Um, and it comes out early on in which she says, um, growing up in Portland, she was surrounded, in essence, by um, those things that you would expect to find in Portland. Um, and that there was some fear that she would drift away from her Syrian heritage. Um, if you just replace Syrian for Ukrainian, you would know my upbringing. At the same time, I was embarrassed by my Syrian heritage. I would watch Disney Channel and wish for a grandmother who would wear pastel cardigans and bake chocolate chip cookies. Instead, I got a grandmother who made couscous while telling stories of the Six Days War. Um, I wonder, Hannah, if you can give us a bit of a um, an understanding of what's in the collection and how you ultimately uh, accumulated some of these materials. There's some great stories in these collections. Amazing. I'm going to, uh, not out of rudeness, but I have to sit every once in a while. 
I will pay attention, but I give you the podium. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me here, Mark. Uh, and thank you to um, the Antiquarian Booksellers uh, Association. I really love the process of putting this collection together and of putting this essay together. And it's funny, the first thing that came to my mind when I was writing this essay um, is the fact that my parents, despite being Muslim, worshiped the Holy Trinity, doctor, lawyer, engineer. <laughs> And I think so much of the uh, immigrant narrative gets caught up in that sense of working hard and becoming successful in a new country. But I really wanted to illuminate the comic aspects of it to give this really colorful, three-dimensional idea of what that heritage looks like beyond what you might see on the six o'clock news or in history textbooks or um, oftentimes in library or collections that aren't really representative of the Middle East and also of the Arab American experience. And so, as Mark mentioned, my collection starts off um, with these picture books that my mom would bring back from Syria, as well as these Arabic textbooks that she used to teach me and my siblings Arabic when we were in the uh, United States. You know, I was born and raised here, but my mom was insistent um, that you know we would learn how to speak Arabic, and we did. Um, but, you know, I did it by, you know, the skin of my teeth, kicking and screaming, because I didn't see that value in that heritage. And I think that, you know, because my mom, because my dad made such an effort to keep bringing these books back for me, eventually I caught that bug, I became one of the gently mad, and I uh, started collecting books on my own. And of course the irony is that by that time, uh, my family could no longer go back to Syria because of um, the civil war going on there. So it really became a test of my commitment to my identity, but also a test to my creativity in finding these materials and collecting these materials. And this is a period in my collection where I actually start to go a little bit more bilingual uh, because I'm sharing these books with my friends. I want them to see what my heritage is as well. And so this collection is really a reflection of that inner process of coming to terms with my identity and then eventually learning to value it. And I am so honored to be here today. Um, and I'm also, you know, so happy that there are also these incredible young book collectors around me whose stories are fascinating and incredible and just really speak to, you know, how personal experiences can be so well embodied in books, which even though they're not alive, really come to have a life of their own. Thank Bravo. you. Congratulations. Thank you very much. So this, of course, is a collegiate book collecting competition. So Anna comes from Washington University, St. Louis, and uh, Hannah comes from Harvard University. We're going to turn our attention uh, to the middle of the country only by adopting a university. He has locations elsewhere. Uh, but we're turning to KU, not UK, uh, Kansas University. Um, Paul uh, Schwenessen. Sh I told him I've been practicing German all day, and then I find out it's Americanized like everything else. Um, came in as a second uh, uh, award winner uh, for his book collection, which was entitled Borderlands, a Manifesto on Overlap. We want to come up and give him a round of applause, please. <laughs> this is a different kind of identity that Paul is, is um, searching out. Uh, in this case, he's rooted in the land, but he's trying to understand what the generations of family that preceded him and those that came before him have in connection to the land. So it's a book collection that documents uh, the borderlands, um, a family cattle ranch along uh, the region of Arizona, New Mexico, and Mexico, correct? Right. Um, which are divided, as Paul refers to, uh, by artificial lines. Um, and then goes on to uh, build a book collection that documents, in essence, the various layers of populations and impacts on this land, starting with Aztecs all the way up to the, um, the lost um, Esteban, who wanders from Florida to Mexico uh, in the late 16th century, um, uh, has materials about the first domestic livestock that are brought onto this vast land, and ultimately um, goes into exploration around indigenous backgrounds of, of Spanish colonialism, 
uh, current conservation issues and others. Um, it's um, an impressive and broad collection. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, the impetus behind it for you personally. Sure. I, sh I should know better than try to bring out a, a, a literary aphorism uh, in front of a group of bibliophiles, but, but Samuel Johnson once said something to the effect of nothing so concentrates the mind as the certain knowledge that one will be hanged in a fortnight. <laughs> and there's a little bit of that here too, that it, slightly less dramatically, but it's, it's hard to quite understand your homeland, where you're really from, until you leave it. Right. And we've probably all experienced that to one degree or another, and this is certainly my my personal case. Um, I came to the University of Kansas through some complicated uh, personal machinations that, that led me there. And, and this book collection, I suppose I shouldn't reveal this, but this book collection was not actually uh, a collection in the traditional sense. I, I only realized that I had a collection by putting together this, this, uh, this essay. I realized that I had been collecting in a, in a non-linear fashion, that this collection was, was building sort of in the background, right? So this wasn't a, wasn't a later focused ambition of mine to generate a collection that, that spans the, the borderlands of the American Southwest. But it turns out in, 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 in sort of afterthought that it actually was, that there was a, there was a surreptitious uh, subliminal act going on here of this, of this book collecting. And it was a joy to realize that what I had and what it, what it meant to me and what my home meant to me, and and that it only meant that much to me by being separated from it. So I appreciate the opportunity to to sort of reveal that to to the wider reading audience, and it's been an absolute joy. And thank you for making this this happen. And now for our uh, first place winner, uh, Samuel. Uh, Vincent Lemley, University of Virginia. Congratulations, let's give the man. <laughs> uh, whose essay and collection is uh, surrounded around the concept of collecting Sicilian printing, uh, Bibliotheca Genealogica, Sicilian printing, 1704 to 1893. Um, in this, uh, Sam, is it Sam or Samuel? Sam. Sam. Um, uh, Sam discusses a bit of the impetus behind this collection, which in fact is to um, represent uh, his heritage, all the members of his uh, historical genealogy, by a book that's published in Sicily in their year, uh, which is a, a rather unique approach to a book collection, but it's fascinating in what uh, he manages to pull together. So over the span of time from 1704 to 1893, 1704 being the earliest uh, family that can be traced, uh, he began the process of, of tracking down publications printed in Sicily. And uh, he has a gathering that covers everything from devotional literature to constitutional history, uh, from the study of astronomy all the way up to the study of river mollusks. I think that's my favorite. Um, and, and discovers many things about uh, local printing, Sicily in fact being very much a uh, a region of local printing in which the materials really aren't intended to, to go out into the larger world and as a result have a very kind of local and um, in some ways ephemeral feeling to them. Uh, but I just want to read a little from his essay and then we'll let him chatter uh, even longer than me. In assembling this collection, I have sought to represent my ancestral past by gathering material products of my ancient culture. Invariably, books bear traces of their human makers, sometimes literally, but always figuratively. Books are hieroglyphs of an absent human presence, evidence that cultures far off or forgotten wrote, read, thumbed, and discarded books as we do. In this vein, I have sought to follow G. Thomas Tensel's primary rationale for collecting, albeit in a narrower genealogical sense. Each title listed here tells something about a human being who lived in a particular time and place. In this case, the human beings happen to be my forebears. So I wonder if you could uh, tell us, Sam, a little bit about this process. It's a very interesting gathering. It's a great catalog put together. If you could talk a little bit about your experience of, of hunting down Sicily, if you would. Yeah. So um, I should say that my collection was inspired and continues to be guided by my grandfather's genealogical research, 
he's been working on for decades and actually just published in book form um, three years back, I think. Um, so that's that sort of underwrites everything that I've managed to do. Um, in terms of gathering the collection, most of it actually um, I've bought from Italian dealers online. Um, a lot of these materials are still in Sicily, as you'd imagine. Um, the Sicilian books aren't typically viewed as collectible or desirable. Um, but because of that, uh, I've been able to acquire a lot of things uh, fairly inexpensively, which is great. Um, yeah, I think um, just the idea being that uh, the motivation behind the collection being you know, this sort of desire to find a material link with my ancestral past that you know, is, is my own, is you know, innately mine, but also inaccessible in a way. So trying to, to find some, some link uh, to, to my ancestors. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Uh, congratulations to all our award winners, and thank you very much to our sponsors. Those of us who live in the world of books in any variety um, of profession, whether it be a curator or book dealer or collector, uh, understand um, the sentimental nature of this for all of us. Um, the fact that book collecting can speak to a, a, another generation with uh, passion and personality is, is very reassuring. So thank you all very much for the evening.